Thank you so much, Suzanne. Well, it's election week uh, this Thursday. It is time to vote as we head to the polls as a nation. And I would encourage you, do what you can to discover and listen and learn about what the parties are saying. You might have found uh, uh, in the past or even in this coming week, uh, things like question time are quite a useful thing to know what different political parties think. Question time is a program on the BBC, on both the TV, iPlayer, and uh, on uh, the radio, where they take people from across the political spectrum They put them in the room, and uh, they have the audience ask them questions. The panelists get put on the spot. They haven't heard the questions before the audience asks them. And usually, they are kind of uh, questions on key kind of themes of the moment, key issues that are being talked about. I wonder, as we go to this election, what are the issues that matter to you? What are the ways you're going to discern who you should vote for. There's a great uh, website, if you're wondering about uh, how you should vote, uh, called whocanivoteforco.uk. Uh, I'd encourage you, because we see the big kind of national picture, but just a reminder, you do vote locally. You vote for your local MP, and that kind of then uh, determines as that kind of national picture is made up, who then becomes the Prime Minister. So do take time to think and look at who you vote for locally in your different regions. And uh, this is a kind of time where actually you can't get away sometimes from uh, all the different people's opinions. Uh, This weekend, many of the papers are saying who they would endorse. Uh, The Sunday papers saying, you know, vote for this person or that person. Uh, Many of them going with, as you'd expect, the ones they always go with. Some of them, though, saying... Maybe it's time for change. And uh, I often find it helpful reading the I. And uh, the I, which is the independent paper, has a, a spread. It's been going through different things. And this weekend, it's all on tax and the economy. Now, don't joke. Because actually, issues about the economy are often top issues in any given election. You know, what is going to happen uh, to our economy? How are we going to solve some of the problems that we're in? And in Jesus' time, in the context of the passage we just read, Jesus goes into a situation that kind of becomes question time on political issue. He walks into this situation where the Pharisees and Herodians are asking him a political question on the issue. They want to catch him out. You see, the context of the day was Roman occupation. I don't know if you realize, but uh, from 63 BC, the Romans took over that whole region of uh, where Jesus lived. And actually in AD 6... So just shortly after Jesus' birth, uh, uh, that region of Judea and Samaria become so troublesome to govern that uh, they actually stepped up kind of the Roman rule in that area, put some more direct rule in. They, uh, it meant there were more soldiers around. It meant that any kind of uh, uprising was quelched and uh, done with. And so the Roman soldiers would have been a constant reminder that they were an occupied people. I wonder if you can imagine what it must have been like to live in that situation. And these guys come and they ask Jesus a question that potentially puts him in real jeopardy. It's a challenging question about how are they meant to live in this situation. And uh, it, it's challenging because the reality was that the Roman occupiers were a vivid reminder that this world is not all it should be. There are evil forces at work, and we uh, saw that last week as we were thinking about the end of the Lord's Prayer, deliver us from evil. In fact, this C.S. Lewis quote felt uh, very apt for the time that they were living in. Uh, C.S. Lewis writes this in Mere Christianity. He says, this universe is at war, a civil war, a rebellion, and we are living in a part of the universe occupied by the dark power that is rebelling against good. Enemy occupied territory, that is what this world is. Christianity is the story of how the rightful king has landed. You might say, landed in disguise as one of us and is calling us to take part in a great campaign of sabotage. Love it. 
So what, Jesus, is our great campaign of sabotage? How do we deal with the forces of evil? I mean, surely we don't give them money to help them in what they do. I mean, surely, if there are forces at work in government who are anti-God, anti-Christian, surely you've got to ask, is it right to give them money to do what they want to do? And that is the question that they pose for Jesus. And, And let's remember, this tax was taken by force, brutally often often with a little bit extra. And so tax collectors, those who had decided to side with the Roman occupiers, were hated. You're for them? You're for this whole tax thing? Get away from us. And yet Jesus here, he's asked a very specific question. In fact, they come and they kind of, they kind of come up to him, you know, Nice interview, kind of, oh, look, you're so great. Look, look what they say about Jesus. I mean, wouldn't this be wonderful to be said about our politicians? Teacher, we know you are a man of integrity. Oh, Lord, for more of those. You aren't swayed by men. Oh, for more of those. You pay no attention to who they are. But you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Oh, God, would you give us more people like that? And I have to say, one of the challenges with democracy is people tend to want to do and say what the people want. Let's pray for our leaders to have courage in difficult choices that they need to make, whatever people might think. But Jesus is someone of integrity. And so they come to him with a question. Is it right to pay the poll tax. They were actually, I won't get into it all, but there were three different taxes, and the poll tax was the one that you just paid for existing. And, uh, and is it right to pay that, they want to know. And they're like a kind of good interviewer pressing it. They're like, don't give us a kind of, well, maybe, whatever, whatever. No, they want to know this. Should we pay or shouldn't we pay? No messing about, Jesus. Should we pay or shouldn't we pay? And there is real risk here for Jesus. If he says, yeah, pay the tax. He's like a tax collector. He's siding with evil. If he says, no, it's like, hey, Roman soldiers, this is, this is worthy of arrest. So what is he going to do? And I don't know if you've ever felt like you're in a situation, maybe at work or with family and friends, where there's kind of difficult issues that come up, maybe very sensitive political issues, and you're like, What do I say here? What do I do in this dilemma? How do I respond with wisdom? Well, listen in. Watch how Jesus works here. And notice first what he does is he says, look, he knew their hypocrisy. In some translations it said he saw through their pretense. And it would be easy for Jesus to have just pretended then something. I mean, that sometimes is what we do. We kind of for a pretense or hypocrisy or we put on a mask. And Jesus saw through that and he doesn't like it. Brothers and sisters, let's not do pretending. Let's not be hypocrites. And so Jesus, he knew they were trying to trap him. So he could have walked away. He said, I know you're trying to trap me. I'm not going to answer that. And he could have walked away. But he's got something that he wants to tell them and something he wants to say to us that this week, I believe, will help us and will help us as we go forward. He has something to teach us. And he says this, bring me a denarius. Let's look at what he says. Bring me a denarius. And uh, he says, let me look at it. And they brought the coin and he asked them, whose portrait is this? Whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. And then Jesus said to them, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And that's the first thing I just want us to press into for a moment. Give to Caesar what is Caesar. We have a responsibility to those that govern us. He he, he kind of said to them, bring the coin. It wasn't hard for them to find one. We've got a picture of the the coin on the the screen here. It was uh, one that uh, everyone would have been using around the time. Uh, You know, in fact... um, Uh, You know, people were involved in government. They were buying and selling using the Roman coins. And he says to them, kind of, whose inscription was on it? I don't know if you can just go back there to the picture. It was Caesar's inscription, his picture who was on the image of the coin. It was the way that people lived in that society. It was the way that they enabled them to buy and sell and do goods. Because here's the thing. To live in any society, you have to have a form of government that makes it function. 
And so if you're going to use the money of the time, if you're going to use the facilities and services of the time, the roads like the Romans used to use, if you're going to use them, then you have to be willing to pay your part. You know, brothers and sisters, if we want to use the NHS, and it's been one of those weeks of the family where we've had to do that, if you want to live in safety, and many people want to come to this country because of the safety, don't underestimate what it's like living in a place where you don't feel safe for you or your kids. If you want to have an economy that functions, I know it doesn't always feel in the last four years like it has been functioning, but if you want to have one that's functioning, if you want to have one that's got trade agreements and things like that, then you and I need to be willing to Take our responsibility as people of that society seriously. William Barclay says this, no man can accept all the benefits which the state gives him and then opt out of all the responsibilities. Let's not do that. So Jesus says, this coin, it bears Caesar's image. You are using it. They are ruling. They are, they are making this kind of system of government happen. So should you pay your taxes or shouldn't you? You should. Pay your taxes. So I want to ask, are you? Are you paying your taxes? You wouldn't believe how many people try and not pay their taxes. How many times we kind of think, well, it's my money, and I don't like what they're doing with it. They probably can't do as well with me. And I just want to say, whatever this week ahead holds, one of the things we see in Scripture is that we have a part to give our taxes. Interestingly, they ask him, should we pay or shouldn't we? And he doesn't say pay your taxes. He says give your taxes. In fact, give back your taxes. Give to Caesar's what is Caesar's. It's recognition that we're part of something bigger. But tax is not the only thing we are to give. We are to give respect. That's been hard at times through these years. I know there have been times when I've had conversations around the dinner table and we've been saying, oh, I can't believe they've done this or that or what. Or, and yet I've also then tried to say, hey, look, kids, it is actually important to be respectful. Let's watch how we speak about things. You know, one Peter, the Apostle Peter, he says this. Again, in Roman occupied nations, he says, submit yourselves to the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. He goes on and says, Christianity, uh, oh no, that's not the right bit that it goes on to. Um, sorry. Well, it goes on like this and he says, you should silence the talk of foolish people. Live as free people. Do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Honor the emperor. Wow. I mean, this one who's taken over the, the nation. But you see, part of showing respect is that you're actually doing something bigger than that. You're showing that you recognize that God is a God over all. And that actually submission to authority is the right thing to do. There's a rightness in respecting and honoring our leaders. Not because they are right always, but because it is right. Because it's part of our witness of submitting to the office. If you like, there's a respecting of the office that is needed as we move forward. So I don't know what you're going to think of who's going to be in power in a week's time. I don't know even what you think of those who are in power right now, but I would encourage you even now to start practicing in your conversation respect as you talk about your leaders. You know, whoever's next, it will be good practice to start now. Why not even try and say something this week in your workplace or in your family that's respectful to our current prime minister? I've had in the news some people saying terrible things about him. Challenge you. I bet people will notice. Speak with respect. And then when we have a new prime minister, which, well, looks like it might well be what the opinion polls suggest, Keir Starmer is very likely next week to be our prime minister. It's not guaranteed. God only knows. 
But I want to say this, he's not perfect. He will be forced to make difficult choices that you will not like. He will sometimes, as he has done already, do or say things that don't honor God and his word. Yet because we honor God, we will honor him. We will show respect. You know, I think of the monarchy. Many of us still miss the queen. But whatever your views on the monarchy and the king, I imagine today kind of bringing a pound coin or, a, or a, one of the new notes with the king's face on it. Have you seen one of these? You know, the monarchy and the government in our nation are interlinked. You know, whatever the current... Whatever your view of what the reality should be about how the future of the monarchy goes, at the moment they are interlinked. And so as we think about respecting and honoring our prime minister or those that govern us, we need to again honor the king, to pray for those in authority. That's the next thing that we need to do, not just give respect, but to give our prayers. We give our taxes, we give our respect, and we give our prayers. You know, when you pray, you get invested. You get invested. Paul writes to Timothy, and he says this, I urge you, first of all, in 1 Timothy 2, then, to all petitions and intercession and thanksgiving be made for all people. There you go. Add the thanksgiving bit. That will do you good. Do us good. Uh, Made for all people, for kings and all those in authority. Lord, thank you for our prime minister. Thank you for our government. Thank you for the king. Lord, we pray that uh, you would help us Help them so that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. We pray for our government leaders because what they do matters both for how people live and if people can live quiet, peaceful lives with godliness, it pleases God. Notice the godliness bit. And and we pray so that the gospel would be able to spread, as Tim was praying earlier. So we give them our respect, we give them our taxes, we give them our prayers. We have a responsibility to those that govern us. Give to Caesar what is Caesar, but I want to just end this first point with this. Should we give them our vote? And who should we give our vote? Who deserves my vote and your vote? A vote is a very precious thing. Many places and times haven't been able to vote. They couldn't vote in Jesus' time. But the Bible doesn't say you have to vote for this person or that person or this party or that party. In fact, the Bible doesn't even say you have to vote at all. But I would encourage you in this. That voting is engaging with the responsibilities that we have for our government. I remember hearing as I was growing up, all that's needed for evil to prosper is that good people do nothing. And voting would seem to be one of those things that if we just say, well, we don't know who to vote for, or we don't, you know, there's always something wrong with everyone, so we're just going to, you know, opt out. No, wrestle, pray, look for God to lead you, and I would encourage you to vote. Be praying that God would guide and lead you in your voting. Pray that you'd be able to do it thoughtfully. I'd encourage you to engage with things like that website I mentioned. I'd encourage you to pray that uh, God would raise up Christians in politics. I've been praying that for, for you guys here. I've been thanking God and praying for some of those who are involved in politics and praying, God, that you would raise up others. But the passage doesn't just end with give to Caesar what is Caesar's. The passage goes on. And how does it uh, go on? Give to God what is? Give to God what is God's. We have a greater responsibility to God. What is God's? What is God's? What is Jesus referring to here? Well, those who he was speaking to will have known well how the Bible starts in Genesis 1 with God creating man and women in his own image in Genesis 1.27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So do you remember that coin? It had a kind of faded image of the emperor on it. But 
You and I, faded though it might sometimes be, distorted though it might sometimes be, yet you and I have the image of God in our lives and in everyone's lives. They are made in the image of God. That's one of the reasons why we're to show proper respect, yes, to those who are in authority, but even to everyone. Wouldn't it be great if our discourse could be marked by respect more? You know, Ian Simpkins, the pastor of Bridge Church, says people are more than hashtags, parties and camps. You know, don't just pigeonhole people. They're they're more complex than that. He says kindness is possible even when agreement is not. Kindness is possible even when agreement is not. Will you say that with me? Kindness is possible even when agreement is not. But bearing the image of God isn't just about how we relate to each other, but about how we relate to God. We bear his image. Just like people had a responsibility to those that govern them, we have a responsibility to God. What is our responsibility to God? Well, to give him honor and worship In fact, the Bible says and sums up the commands like this is the first and greatest to command, to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That is our responsibility. That's the the law, not of the UK, but that's the law of God, a timeless law. And in fact, William Barclay says this, we've got it on the screen, remember there is a sphere of life which belongs to God and not to Caesar. At one and the same time, these words of Jesus asserted the rights of the state and the liberty of conscience. Should their claims conflict, loyalty to God comes? Loyalty to God comes? First. That means though we respect those in authority, there will be times, and I don't know when this time will come, but I sense it might. When because our loyalty to God is first, that we are willing to take positions and take stands, that even mean we get put in prison or we get thrown out of our jobs, that we get ostracized by people around us. That is our call. That is the call that our brothers and sisters around the world are making in many different places. As they take a stand for Jesus, even as they seek to honor and give respect and taxes and prayers for those in authority, yet our loyalty comes higher. You and I have an allegiance to someone higher than the prime minister or the king. You and I have a responsibility to to God, to give him our gifts, yes. Our prayers, yes. Our respect, yes. Our vote. Well, he's the only one. He's the only one who never runs for office, never goes up for election. The Bible says in Isaiah 9, verse 7, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He does not need or want a tick in the box from you every few years. He is not standing for re-election this week. He wants your life, my life, your love, my love. In its complete entirety. He wants us to love him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. All our days. You know, whatever you vote for on Thursday. If your theology, your thinking about this God. Doesn't lead you to a greater love for him. And a greater love of your neighbor. Which is the second of the kind of way that Jesus sums up the commandments. Then something is wrong. Again, that Pastor Ian Simpkin said, if we 100% align ourselves with any political party, we misalign ourselves with Jesus. Can I say that again? If we 100% align ourselves with any party, we misalign ourselves with Jesus. So who deserves your vote? Well, at this election, you've got to decide prayerfully, thoughtfully, and wisely on Thursday. So I'd encourage you this week, if you haven't done already, be thinking and praying about it. Uh, But... God deserves more than your vote. He deserves your complete allegiance. 
He deserves our lives being orientated around his rule and his kingdom. And this is the staggering thing. As we think about the kingdoms we were even thinking about last week or in the Lord's Prayer, we think about this kingdom of light that Jesus, this one who's landed in disguise in enemy-occupied territory, is bringing in this choice between are we going to serve the kingdom of light or the kingdom of darkness. The staggering thing is that the kingdom of light, as he beckons us and says, put your trust in me, come follow me, he then does something extraordinary. The kingdom of light, the king of light, seems to be willing to submit to the king of darkness. To stand before Pilate and have Pilate say, you know, what is truth? And to say to him, you would have no authority if it were not given you by God himself. Pilate says, I have authority to put you to death. And Jesus said, you would have no authority if it were not given to you by God himself. And he submits himself. He goes to the cross. He suffers and is willing to embrace loss. And it's through the very things that look like letting the enemy win that Jesus brings victory. The cross kind of destroys the kingdom of darkness from the inside out. That means that you can be in a prison camp in North Korea as a Christian under the authority of those who are, who are governing that land and yet by your actions and by your willingness to embrace the way of Christ and suffering and praying for your leaders and, and being willing to give respect even when that doesn't feel like it's true, yet the Lord Jesus is able to take and use that. Whatever happens this week, we can be people who join Jesus' kingdom of light, and from the inside out, transform our nation. It doesn't really ultimately matter who happens to be in charge of our nation in that kind of prime ministerial way. We ought to pray, we ought to vote, but ultimately, the thing that's really going to make a difference is how people respond to the king of light, King Jesus, how you and I will turn to him. I, I want to end with the story of a, a man in Jesus' time who Jesus met. His name was Zacchaeus. He was a tax collector. He was hated. And yet Jesus comes to his home and does a kind of inside-out work in Zacchaeus. So that while it seems he's still a tax collector, yet this tax collector, he, he does this. We read in uh, Luke 19, verse 8, Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Lord, look here, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus says, today, salvation, rescue, freedom has come to this house. The man is still under Roman occupation. And yet God says there's salvation, there's freedom, there's transformation breaking out in his life. You know, you and I, can have our lives transformed by this same Jesus, whoever is in government. You and I can come and say, Lord, be ruler of my life, that I might then be part of your kingdom. And you know, as the people of Jesus' time uh, heard his response, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God's what is God's, we read at the end of Mark 12, it says they were amazed at him. They were amazed at his wisdom. They were amazed at this Jesus and how he spoke and what he did. And I want to say this as I end. As I've read and listened to local candidates, national candidates, both in our own nation, but political leaders even across the world whose voices are sometimes very noisy. And as I've been reading, as I'm doing at the moment, through John's Gospel, As I'm sitting here in our service and standing and singing about this Jesus, I find myself time and again being amazed at Jesus. I find myself thinking, wow. It's not just about who am I voting for, it's who am I following. And I get to follow and have Jesus as my king. I get to have one who, I'm at the end of John's gospel at the moment, who, as you read their kind of resume, it says, died for you and rose and conquered death. I get to have one who has been ruling and reigning in his kingdom of light, bringing 
peace and transformation in people's lives for 2,000 years. I mean, there's no one with more experience of government than that. There's no one more compassionate and courageous and humble. No one who always speaks the truth. No one who's not afraid of what others think. Hey, I'm, I'm with Jesus. Again, not just ticking for it this week and maybe forgetting about it later on. I, I want to be completely his. I want to say, Jesus, who do you want me to vote for? Would you whisper in me this week as I read and pray, Lord, who do you want me to move towards to speak this week when people are talking about big issues, not just to speak about the government, but to speak about you? How can you lead me and guide me? How do you want me to pray? And that is where I want us to end. Because Jesus taught us how to pray. We've been doing a whole sermon series on that. And it's to pray, his kingdom come. His will be done on earth and in our nation. And so if you feel able, would you stand with me? We're going to pray this together. The words are on the screen. We're using the traditional ones this time. But maybe, again, in your heart, would you just come and give yourself afresh to God or even for the first time? And, and would you remember as we pray us, that we're praying for others who might have a different view from us politically. We're praying for our leaders. We're praying a broad prayer that reminds us we're part of a bigger society. And so we pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And so, Lord, as we continue to worship you, Lord, would your wonderful reign extend through our worship and in our lives and through our lives, we pray. Lord, would we be amazed at you afresh. Come, Holy Spirit, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen.